It is a great pleasure to introduce the speaker of today, Grand Rounds, Dr. Ahmed Tizush. Uh, Dr. Tizush is a professor of biomedical informatics in the Department of uh, Artificial Intelligence and Informatics at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Um, he is the founder and director of the Chemia Lab, which is focused on uh, medical image analysis. Before joining uh, the Mayo Clinic, uh, he worked at the University of Toronto and Waterloo. Um, since 1996, his research uh, uh, activity uh, focused on artificial intelligence, uh, computer vision, uh, and medical imaging. He has developed an algorithm for medical image filtering, segmentation, and search. He has introduced the concept of uh, opposition-based uh, learning, which use essentially opposite uh, for better and faster uh, learning. He has author several peer review uh, journals and conference paper, uh, several book chapters uh, and two books. He has also extensively working with uh, um, uh, companies and uh, uh, in creating and uh, advising startups in uh, the sector. And uh, from last year, he founded uh, at Mayo Clinic, uh, the Razes Lab, uh, which is a research group focused on building and using uh, atlases and uh, we uh, i believe uh, going to learn a little bit more about that uh, uh, during the lecture so there is a lot of interest in uh, digital pathology and image analysis and ai and so we are very happy to have you here today and uh, um, the floor is yours thank you very much for the kind introduction um i hope you can hear me and the background noise of the wind storm uh, is not uh, affecting the quality of the sound. So, yeah, I, I just wanted to share with you uh, what you are working at um, under the name and label of Mayo Atlas, uh, which is our idea of using AI um, to attack the variability in medicine. So um, in, in my lab, we have several young MDs, uh, postdocs, PhD students, and interns at the moment. And uh, we... We have only one task, and we try to employ AI technologies, mainly in digital pathology, to build and use atlases, which are organized structures, uh, data sets of histopathology data. So everything for us, of course, it starts with glass slides, and uh, they have been around for quite some time. I don't think they will go away so soon in spite of the digital pathology. So what we do with them, usually we put them on under the microscope and we analyze them. Now we can insert them in a digital scanner, capture a digital image and analyze them. Still more than 90% uh, of uh, hospitals and community uh, clinics and major research uh, universities, they are still using microscopes, maybe less than 10%. It depends where you go in the Scandinavian countries that digitization is um, going way above 50%, 60%. In Canada, which is uh, the home of telepathology, is actually less than 5%. In US, uh, things are picking up. So Mayo is de facto actually 100% digital now by, by end of 2022. And many other hospitals are investing in going digital. So when we start with the glass slide and the tissue sample on it and we analyze it, then we basically store it in archives. Uh, is it in the basement of the hospital or Iron Mountain or other companies that take it and put it in large archives? Mm -hmm. um, the same happens basically when we have digital cases uh, and we get whole slide images, they have to be stored somewhere and that's high performance computing. So the, the costs are there, so the, the investment is necessary, uh, but the, it, it will be different. So it's not a physical storage uh, is a software storage, but then the information is accessible relatively easier than the hard glass slides. So uh, there are many, many um, scanners that people use uh, with different trays to accommodate different type of glass slides. Then uh, the, whoever operates on the uh, scanner has to use the software to put focal points uh, and this is one of the issues of digital pathology that probably some pathologists still need time to get warm up to, because uh, the, the scanner that I showed you is fundamentally a hidden uh, microscope. The, the microscope is the, in that uh, gray box, and the control is now in the hand of the computer. So, but 
uh, whoever works in the lab to capture images can operate that and set focal points and select the region of interest and things like most of it is becoming actually fully automated. So we want to get to when we have whole slide images. So, and the whole slide images are gigapixel files. Most of them are way larger than 50,000 by 50,000 pixels. So, and when patient comes with multiple whole slide images or multiple glass slides, it can easily be 10 gigabyte or more per patient. So, which is, um, which is a challenge from computational perspective, although we, we are hoping that the digital availability of information makes um, analysis uh, possible that was not possible before with, with glass slides. Well, but there are challenges in processing whole slide images, the digitized glass slides. So one of them is that there are there is no label data. So in the general common workflow that we have. So that means if you are working with supervised AI, which most people are, then you have to create labels. It's very tedious, as you know, uh, and uh, is subject to variability. And so we try to avoid it. So we try to not work with supervised AI that requires uh, labeling of gigapixel images, uh, which is uh, which is not a, a grateful task. So and, and other cha challenges that the literature of AI talks about recognition and identification, uh, let's say, uh, of faces. And, but we are working with extremely large images, um, could be easily 100,000 by 100,000 pixels. And uh, so we, we work with small sub-images that we call tiles or patches, as you know. And uh, so th these images are very big, so you can easily uh, fit millions of face images or even X-ray images into one whole slide image. So the, the, the challenge, the computational challenge is really uh, of other dimension. But probably the most important challenge of computerized techniques on working on histopathology data is the diversity is the sheer uh, huge number of uh, is is about is not about textbook that you have four tissue types when when you bring in and you look at different body parts uh, for computer of course this is uh, a prohibitively large search space um, and that's one of the challenges that people hope that AI uh, can help to understand so uh, we are focused on observer variability, something that is, of course, a well-known problem. And uh, usually there are a large number of papers, as you know, uh, published from the clinical side that report variability. In cases here like squamous and non-squamous, non-small cell ca ca lung carcinoma. And we show images to multiple pathologists. We wait a little bit and then show it again. And then we measure inter and intra uh, observer variability. Uh, measured by Cohen's kappa and other uh, other metrics. And sometimes we get relatively high, but most of the time moderate to low, uh, moderate to high uh, measure uh, um, Cohen's kappa, which is agreement among the, uh, the pathologists. What is scary for us non-physicians, the computer scientists, is the intro observable variability, so that we look if we show cases to the same pathologist and then we ask the same pathologist again. Uh, many, many reports show that the, the pathologist has moderate concordance with himself, with herself, which is a scary but is understandable because we are dealing with um, very complex uh, structures and uh, the closer you look, the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, the, the closer you look, things get fuzzier and more ambiguous so it's not it's not an easy task so the the question is the fundamental question in at the beginning of digital pathology and which is coinciding with uh coinciding with uh, the success stories of artificial intelligence is can we use ai to reduce or remove variability in medicine or particularly in histopathology. So fundamentally, there's two different approaches for that. If we use supervised AI and the software tell us basically a yes and no, fundamentally supervised AI provides a yes and no, yes cancer, no cancer, or even grading or a likelihood. So that means to many people, you wanna get rid of the pathologist, which is an outrageous thing to say or to think. Uh, but if you do that, if you manage to do it, um, who should write the report? 
uh, and uh, in, in spite of the pe things that people think chat GPT and other technologies can do that, no, they can't. Uh, so writing a histopathology diagnostic report is a highly complex and sophisticated task. So there are other techniques that you can use or the same techniques package it in terms of search and matching, and you can find similar cases to build consensus and show it to pathologists. And that would uh, de facto strengthen the position of the pathologist to write a better report in a shorter time. Very different ideas based on the same technology. So classification or supervised AI emphasizes decision-making, whereas search and retrieval emphasizes virtual peer review. So uh, um, finding evidence in the past cases and package them in a way that the physician, the pathologist, can use it to remove uncertainty about the decision-making. Very different approaches, but the supervised AI is highly popular. The mainstream AI is almost entirely about supervised AI for, for different reasons that I will uh, talk about some of them, hopefully. So can AI remove observable variability? So or maybe remove sounds quite drastic. Maybe the expectation is just reduce it, not, not remove it. But AI has big claims, so why not? So can you remove the variability? So if AI has to do one thing is removing variability, if AI cannot do that, I, I wouldn't know why we should use AI. So if I if I show an image to a classifier, then which is supervised AI, the, again, so most of the time is a yes and no, is a grading, is a likelihood, subtyping, things like that. So what is it that you're saying if you use supervised AI? Let's say we have a classifier, a deep network, and the accuracy is 99%, and it doesn't collapse when we do uh, external validation with the data from another hospital. What is it that we are saying with respect to observable variability? We are saying that many physicians, many pathologists have to accept what the machine says. That's what we are saying. I don't think this is going to happen. Why? Because at the end of the day, it's the pathologist who has to write the report for the foreseeable future. And even if you had the technology to for software to write part of the report, who would take the responsibility for that? The software company? I don't think so, even if you have the technology. So this is not going to happen. This does not fit within the workflow. This does not fit within the uh, framework and paradigm of the things that we do usually in medicine. So, but if I give an image to a search engine and the search engine goes into the archive of our, of our patients from the past and find similar cases with accompanied with the metadata, with the diagnostic reports, with the treatment plan, with the outcome, and it brings them back, what we are saying is that the pathologist has to accept what many other physicians say. So that, that should work more easily. And the only condition is that the pathologist who is looking at that image and has inquired to find similar cases has to be convinced that the semantics is correct, that when we say the morphology is similar, the pathologist has to be convinced that yes, the morphology, the images, the patients that you found is really similar to mine. That's the only condition. Otherwise, he would not or she would not rely on AI, AI, but on the other colleagues who have done diagnosed similar cases. Very different platform. It depends how, how we package and show it to the, to the pathologist. So what we call Mayo Atlas is fundamentally an AI operating on index multimodal data. So cases that are evidently diagnosed and they should be free from variability. So we double check and triple check them and say that we agree. So there is consensus that the diagnosis was dipped, the subtop was dipped, this. And uh, so if we have that, then we have the pathologist looking at a case where he or she is not uh, sure. And then we send an inquiry to the Atlas and say, have you seen a case like this? So it's like we do a uh, consult and asking second opinion, but our colleagues are not there. So we are doing that in their absence. We are doing that computationally. So, and then we find similar cases. We find similar cases that the morphology matches if the image is the only thing we have. And of course, together with the images, a lot of other information is available. Longitudinal data is available uh, for the patient. So we can package that in a non-overwhelming way, which is, which is a must. And the AI community doesn't care about that. 
So if you want to deploy, you have to make sure that you do not overwhelm the pathologist, which has already to do a lot of work during the day. And you cannot ask him to or ask her to do, take a look at all the data associated with these three patients or five patients that we think is similar. <clears throat> so we have to visualize it in a user-friendly way, package it and show it to the pathologist as evidence. So the past cases are empirical evidence. If molecular data is the ultimate evidence in some cases, then the empirical, uh, the, the, the evidently diagnosed cases from the past are empirical evidence and which we are not using right now. They are just sitting in our archives. We have spent a lot of time and effort to make those diagnoses, and we know the outcome, but we are not using them. So this approach, use, building and using atlases, will go after tabbing into the medical wisdom and experience of the past, and we should not make the same mistakes again and again. So the search query can be the whole slide image. It can be a patch, a part of it. It could be a region. It could be anything. It doesn't matter. So when you have the when you have the tissue, when you have the glass slide digitized, then you are very flexible and you can, you can organize your inquiry in any way you want. So you are looking at something, we send it to a search engine that taps into the um, Mayo Atlas, and then we find similar cases. We retrieve everything that is associated with those cases, let's say diagnostic reports in this case, and then we package it. So interestingly, again, so there's one pathologist who is looking at that new patient but the cases that we retrieved have been diagnosed by other pathologists. So we are, again, we are just, the AI is the facilitator among the pathologists themselves to use each other knowledge. AI is not making any decision. AI is only uh, finding relationships, correlations, and uh, sim similar morphology in a database. That's what it should do properly. The rest is just packaging and visualization. So if you do that for a query image for a new patient and you find cases, let's say top three patients similar, and you can look at top five, top 10, top 100, just to get the statistics to make a recommendation, and you combine those diagnostic reports that come with those patients, you can build what we call computational second opinion. So when you say, okay, we think this is this, this is the, this subtype, this is, we should do this. If a recommendation is necessary, this can just provide the information without making a recommendation, which because whenever you the computer says something, you may in fact bias the pathologist. So ideally, we should let the pathologist do his her job, and then if there is uncertainty and the pathologist uh, inquires into the atlas, then we ask, okay, do you know what you want to do? Are you sure you want to have our computational second opinion? And then we can show something. So it, the, its packaging is very important. It's not just a core technology. Tissue representation is, of course, paramount. How do we represent tissue uh, in the computer? So we usually put it through some deep networks, but we are not interested in the decisions that deep networks are making. We are interested in what we call embeddings or feature vectors. So we take those feature vectors and then every patient, every subtype of every malignancy, every abnormality becomes a point in a very complex space. This type of diagrams are being used everywhere. But if you apply that on the atlas, it becomes meaningful because the atlas in a well-selected, well-curated data set, highly valued assets of uh, medicine, of in particular in, in pathology. So that visualization is when you have something like that, then you can place new patients in the space, look at the proximity and see with which patients we have more patient group, we have more overlap. Of course, we have to do the atlas in a multi, create the atlas in a multimodal way. So imaging data, molecular data, textual data, we have experimented with RNA sequencing, with uh, diagnostic reports, whatever in the clinical workflow of that specific disease for that particular primary site is relevant, should be in the atlas, whatever is in is being used in the practice or in research. It could be atlas is used for research, not just for uh, diagnosis or prognosis. So patient representation is very important. So how do we represent patients in the computer? So there is imaging data and you can put it to a deep network. 
um, make some decision or not. It could be molecular data genomics that you send, some sort of genomics you send to a network. It could be textual data, patient demographic, any information we have uh, in LIS and other data set, uh, databases. And then you can put them together, make the outcome could be diagnosis, treatment planning, prognosis. It doesn't matter because we are not interested in the outcome, uh, the outcome of the of the network. We are interested, and you can you can connect this. You can connect imaging and genomics and textual data during training, such that they learn from each other. What we are interested in is in the patient representation. So, in the last layers of this complex network, which nobody understands what is doing, and take take that as representation. So, we do not we we do not uh, uh, include what the network says in the output. It says this is. Uh, the, this subtype or that subtype, we're just interested in the embedding. We take the embedding to index patients to put in the atlas. So, and based on that, based on looking at the atlas, we can uh, generate what we call a consensus report, and it, which is a list of likely matches, primary diagnosis, um, matching degrees to what degrees, what is the confidence level that we say they match, visualization of regions that the tissue of your patient matches with the evidently diagnosed tissue uh, tissue of the patients in the in the atlas and a synopsis of a standard description so auto captioning so generate a set of keywords or maybe small phrases or small sentences that describe well, what uh, what uh, the tissue is this could go eventually in a synoptic report and optionally we can make a record Recommendation, like a classifier. Yes, we would we would not like to do that. So, as from the computer from the computation perspective, we don't like to do it, but it's possible. And if it's desired, we can do that. And of course, you can set that report to any device. It could be handheld device like cellular phones, and you can capture a, a part of an image if if you have to, if you are not in a clinical setting and you don't have access to. Uh, high performance computing, you can even use your cell phone to do that. And that could have some applications for developing countries and remote places. But if you do that and allow people to upload images into Atlas, which hopefully we want to go online on within the campus in summer and do that. So then people can upload whole side images at different magnification. They can upload one patch. They can upload several patches of the image. So you have to be prepared to deal with any type of data. And so if we do that, so we have to also make sure that down the road, uh, uh, we want to make this available in the tradition of Mayo, who likes to share whatever we learn, share to with the rest of the world. We want to share it in terms of a website. And then if people across the world come and inquire, so we have to make sure that they can deal with that diversity of data. Uh, which will bring a lot of variation. So the, a little bit about the background works that has led to um, creation of the Mayo Atlas, which is at the very beginning, initial phases. So we, we developed a search engine that we call Utixel. And uh, the Utixel is based on an idea that you take the tissue sample and you find patches that are relevant, unsupervised, nothing, nothing with delineation. And then you create a mosaic. And this mosaic represents everything that is important in the whole slide image. And then you convert that to some binary form, some fingerprint, some like iris code that we use in airports for identification of people. And then those binary informations are what is representative for the computer, not for the pathologist. The pathologist will not see this. Just how, how the computer understands the tissue sample is that black and white bunch of dots that is in the computer such that computer can make computation fast, again, because histopathology data is really huge, gigapixel data, and we need some tricks to make it happen. And then you can start searching. So on the left, you have your uh, input image, and on the right, you have the re retrieved top three cases, and the, you could fail. So you could fail and you find something that is not the right outcome. However, so depending on so are you looking at the top three similar patients, top five similar patients, and so on? So the more you get, the better becomes the recommendation, but you cannot show the top 100 similar patients to the pathologist. Again, so probably top three is the 
the most uh, you can do because it, it takes additional work to look at them and to convince yourself that this is in fact relevant. So we did that, for example, we looked at the judgment of three pathologists uh, in a, a concordance of three pathologists with the search engine and green is positive correlation, uh, red is negative correlation. We found a huge correlation between what the search engine was suggesting and the three pathologists were lo looking at saying, yeah, it is there. So there was agreement, which means the majority vote among search results has a high concordance with what individual pathologists would also find correct. Something that has to be done again and again for some other <clears throat> cases, but <clears throat> sorry, is a comforting factor. We did the largest uh, validation on the TCGA data to test that Utixel search engine. So we Utix, uh, TCGA, as you know, uh, has uh, 25 anatomic size, 32 cancer subtypes, all slide images for 11,000 patients. Um, so we indexed <clears throat> and searched almost 30,000 whole slide images because patients had several glass slides. And we assessed the conservative majority vote. So that means if I get the top three, at least two of them have to be the right one for me to say that was correct. <clears throat> And then we looked at both frozen sections and paraffin embedded the diagnostic slides. And we saw high accuracy for both of them. And it could it was almost scary to see that the accuracy can go 200% in some cases. This is not classification. This is looking, this is my patient. I don't know what that is. Find similar patients. Look at the majority of the subtyping for those similar cases and tell me what it is. Very different approach, although the core technologies are, are um, the same. So the, 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 uh, the, this paper that was uh, published in Nature Digital Medicine showed that computational consensus is possible. Of course, other uh, studies are still needed. We are doing repeating that with this, uh, the same thing with internal data. Uh, to hopefully verify the findings. So the first ATLAS case that we have started at Bayo is the skin cancer, cartilage squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, we have some 750 uh, patients. Uh, we have for 510 of them, um, W slide label, which is highly differentiated, moderately differentiated and poorly differentiated. And uh, some of them are still not labeled. So because again, the labeling has to be free from variability. So we are we are still in process of verifying those. So 75% of them were highly differentiated and then only 7% poorly differentiated. We are also working on that because we will see that it has an effect on the statistics. Uh, <clears throat> if you do supervised AI, you cannot do supervised AI with this. This is highly imbalance because with 7% of that class of poorly differentiated tissue, there is not much you can do with AI techniques. So uh, for uh, I'm, I know that we cannot see any details here and I don't have the zooming uh, functionality here, just showing you some examples, the well differentiated cases, moderately differentiated cases and poorly differentiated cases. And then we use the Utixel patching to grab some samples automatically, unsupervised, no labeling involved, grab some patching from each, um, from each whole slide image to index. Because again, this is a lot of data. At the moment, we cannot index everything. So we have to grab some of it to index, which is a big challenge. So what happens if the malignancy we are looking is small? Then we may miss it, in fact. The possibility is there. So we are looking at it, how we can improve this. Um, but the patching so far works quite nicely for the majority of things. And then when we look at the top one result, which is a classifier, basically, the accuracy for highly differentiated was higher than fully differentiated naturally. And you don't have a well-structured uh, confusion matrix. If you go to top three, the results get better. And if you go to top five, we get to almost 90% accuracy for highly differentiated, but for the poorly differentiated, which is a very small set of cases that we have, you drop even to 36%. So this, is, this was again, confirming what we had in that major study with the TCGA data, that 
the more you have, the better the statistics. So we are adding more cases of poorly differentiated such that we have, uh, we are covering the diversity of the tissue. So the, uh, and the patching has to change. So when you talk about not just this case is also about uh, uh, rare subtypes in other, for other primary diagnosis, uh, the, the, the patching matters. So where you take samples, of course, matters. This is something the pathology does, the pathologist does on a daily basis by going back and forth on the glass slide and finding the regions of interest and focusing on that. The computer has to, has to do that as well. The problem is we don't want to do it in a supervised uh, uh, way. We want to do it in an unsupervised approach such that it's reliable and computationally efficient. <clears throat> The second atlas case is epithelial breast lesions that we are working on. So we have an atlas of 38 breast epithelial, uh, uh, epithelial breast lesions, and then new cases come and we match uh, um, uh, every case that comes in with whatever is in the atlas. So at, uh, we, we have been experimenting with the WHO atlas in the WHO uh, blue book, and we have the cases and we have the test cases. <clears throat> And of course, the papers in the literature of AI, everybody talks about lobular and uh, ductal uh, carcinoma, whereas the subtypes, the rare subtypes that are the major difficulty, they are not covered most of the time. So we, if we plot all those epithelial breast lesions, according to the WHO <clears throat> uh, uh, terminology, we get something like this. And if we just look at the high cellular patches, more or less is the same, uh, but you get a little bit more separation between the subtypes. So this is the first time that you can look at. So this is basically the picture of the atlas. So this is all subtypes that you have for breast epithelial lesions. And now every patient that comes, you can match it into the atlas and place it in this space and say, okay, where is my patient? And uh, to what uh, type other subtypes has similarity. So we had, for example, very successful matching uh, when we had encapsulated papillary carcinoma, uh, for instance, or even solid uh, papillary carcinoma. But we had also cases where the matching was not very successful. So when we looked at the left side, which was the case, the papilloma in the atlas, on the right side, the test papilloma is, is quite quite understandable that it was successful because the similarity is striking. No wonder, of course, it has to find uh, a case like that. And also for papillary, for encapsulated papillary, the one in Atlas on the left, very similar to the test image, the, the new patient on the right. So uh, the concept of similarity works, but there are challenges and we are looking at uh, the diversity that the, at the moment we don't have enough challenging test data. We will be publishing a paper soon to report where is the difficulty. It seems the patching has to change when we are talking about rare subtypes. That's the main challenge. So because for that, you need exhaustive patching and comparison. You cannot do it with just one or two patches. You need more samples. And we have to do it in, in, in an unsupervised way. So the challenges that we are dealing with is there are many, many challenges that we are dealing. So does the images contain the right tissue? So for example, if you put a long atlas or skin atlas and you upload a kidney image, so we have to recognize that this is the wrong primary site and say, no, you cannot do this. Um, uh, does the image contain any abnormality? Maybe you upload uh, a normal a tissue uh, glass slide with normal tissue, no finding. So then we have to be able to say, well, it doesn't match with anything. It seems this is normal. Um, the, there is a stain variability. Do, do we need normalization of staining? Uh, most likely, yes. If we look at going from hospital to hospital. People may upload patches and we don't know what magnification is that. So you need to recognize magnification before you do anything else. You cannot compare 10X with 40X. You, you see different things. It's not the same thing. Uh, as uh, as you hopefully would agree with me. And of course, <clears throat> there are different type of images and you have to do a multimodal training. And we have to replace search with matching. So which means we have to find the region of interest, the ROI, the abnormality that is in focus. And that's the biggest challenge. How do we do that without labels and without training a supervised AI? 
if he can do that and find the abnormality, the malignancy, and we index that, then the matching becomes much more uh, easily uh, straightforward and doable. So I will stop here. Hopefully, <clears throat> um, this has been uh, useful. And uh, I don't know what how much time we have. So it seems we have a lot of time. So for questions eventually. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amid. I mean, this is really fascinating. Um, I uh, I have a question, but I see that in the audience there are already uh, some questions. Uh, Delay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Amir. That, that was really very, you know, complex and simple at the same time. So that took a lot of skills to, to put uh, the combination together. I like your uh, skin data that was looking at the different uh, grades of squamous cell carcinoma. I think that's quite uh, interesting. Now, by coming to the poorly differentiated uh, squamous, I wonder what your experience was using this algorithm with uh, so uh, sarcomatoid uh, squamous cell carcinoma would be poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. And sometimes that is the area where pathologists might struggle to determine, am I really looking at an epithelial or is it a sarcoma and everything? Now, granted that in your database, there are probably other you know, sarcomatous database and everything. So how does the AI handle cases where a, an epithelial lesion like squamous cell is beginning to look like a sarcoma. Is he able to differentiate and say, no, don't go that pathway? <clears throat> Tough question. Uh, we, we in that in that validation with the TCGA data, we reported two type of search. Yeah. One is what we call vertical search, when we only search within the primary site and say, uh -huh. okay, you tell me long, I stay within the long, I only search to find matches with the lung tissue. We also did what we call horizontal search. So if you have lung atlas and kidney atlas and prostate atlas, sometimes we don't know what that is. And you say, okay, can you search in everything? Maybe this type of malignancy came from somewhere else. So if, the, if we have unknown primary, basically. So, and we did that too. And interestingly, and we have a core diagram in that paper that shows in majority of the cases, when you gave me, a long image, I found long, sometimes I found prostate. And then we look, what, why is this happening? Why, when you give me long image, the software finds prostate. It was 20 eggs, a small patch. It was long adenocarcinoma input and software find prostate adenocarcinoma. Why, if you, do, if you go that close, maybe things become indistinguishable. But using what we call the horizontal search, so using... Uh, in multiple atlases, if available. So this is a big question. Do we have uh, multiple atlases available? Then we may find those type of things. Otherwise, every atlas is a specialized, like the subspecialty in pathology. So every atlas is saying, okay, I'm looking at this primary site and I'm looking at the diversity of this malignancy and subtyping for this primary site. But if we go across the atlas, we may be able to see uh, more. Uh, which I would say we have, we don't have enough data in literature yet, but it seems is a promising direction to go. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Uh, thank you very much. I enjoy that. So you think it's possible like to uh, search through atlases, not like site specific, because sometimes there are cases that um, may be uh, difficult to classify within uh, you know that category and so you have to move across different atlases i guess that's right in that tcga validation we report extensive results for so the image comes in we know it is kidney but we search in everything so we compare kidney with prostate and breast and brain and everything to just to see what happens because the idea was if i give you kidney you should find kidney so such that you you have some understanding of the histology of the primary site. But then the other side of it is unknown primaries that you can also use that for. So the results were encouraging, very encouraging. Uh, and uh, definitely this is something that we are keeping in mind to work on it further. And there is a question from Nathan. Yeah, this is a phenomenal talk. Thank you so much uh, for presenting to us. So. As you know, prediction models are getting better and better the more training data that you have. So 
do you think there's going to be an arms race between different companies trying to vacuum up other institutions' data? Or do you think there's the possibility of collaboration and crowdsourcing better and better models? I've been part of, I'm relatively new at, in, at Mayo, and I've been part of delegation to visit multiple companies in the, in the field. I don't think this is something companies can do. I think technologies like this, creating smart databases, high value assets. What, why is it high value? Because of what pathologists put in there, medical knowledge. Exactly. I don't think companies can do that. I think this is for uh, hospitals to do uh, and for probably uh, hosp research hospitals mainly to do because you have the data, you understand the data and you can do it. So uh, companies have the technology, but if hospitals manage to develop uh, the, the qualified teams, we can do that. So we don't need the companies to do it. Um, and when we think about that we in the long term we have a lot of other challenges so you cannot have a static atlas things change terminology change new diseases come subtypes will shift concept will drift so for all that you need to permanently adjust your atlas which is because it's inherently unsupervised you don't need any retraining you just add new cases because and you you just add another subtype you change the name of another subtype is very easily extendable and maintainable and this is by its nature something hospitals should do not companies so do you think every hospital is going to have their own database for atlas or do you think there's the ability to to look across institutions because more, the more the more data the better right Absolutely. And here is down the road, I think a universal atlas will be definitely possible. When would that be? Five years from now? Ten years from now? I don't know. Hopefully in my lifetime. So egoistically, I can also contribute. But but uh, I see the concept of building and using atlases, which is a structured medical knowledge. Nothing new. Nothing new. But we are just seeing it in the light of digitization and the AI success and puts the pathologists and other type of physicians in the center, combined with other technologies like federated learning. There you go. You can collaborate, we can share atlases among hospitals, fantastic technologies that need a lot of infrastructure and collaboration, which has nothing to do with the technology. Things have to happen on the political side among the leaderships of the hospital to make this type of things happen. But the technology is there. So create your own atlas, but collaborate with others without exchanging data, which everybody seems to be afraid of or mindful of, with using technologies like federated learning. So I think federated learning, self-supervised atlas building is, are the future of, they, it has the potential to change the face of medicine. Exciting times. Thank Thanks. You. John? Uh, thank you very much for that uh, talk. Um, you alluded to this point in your in a couple of your slides, but I'd like to expand on a little bit. Of course, diagnoses are made not just on morphology, but on uh, clinical story, on uh, immunohistochemistry, molecular uh, uh, information, cytogenetics. Can you expand a little bit on how uh, the AI system will incorporate all these other uh, uh, modalities? Absolutely. Uh, um, most crucial uh, aspect, uh, as I just alluded to, as you mentioned, so we have to be we have to build multimodal atlases that reflect the reality of the clinical practice. That we no pathologist just look at the image. There is a lot of other stuff going in on in his mind, and there is other information that is being used among other IC uh, patient demographic consultation with other colleagues about uh, other factors. So. We definitely have to build atlases that are multimodal. So image comes in, CD20 comes in, CD5 comes in, uh, X-ray comes in maybe in some cases. <laughs> so uh, patient demographic comes in, if available, RNA sequencing comes in, uh, and we then takes it and index it. If we do it multimodal, which means we index every modality separately, that's easily done. We, have, we can do it right now, and we are doing it right now. But if you do what we people call cross-modality, that's more difficult, which is I take, the, let's say, just uh, HND image, IHC, RNA sequencing and report, and they have to be trained together. 
and learn from each other. That's very complicated from computer science perspective. And we have done twice. So we have done image and text and image and RNA sequencing. As a matter of fact, our paper will come out in Nature Communication Biology next week that we did uh, predict from the morphology RNA sequencing. So the information seems to be there. So we can do the multimodal in many different ways. The, the technology of doing them separately is available. We can do it and we can index every modality, every data, every exam of the patient separately and then combine them. And then, which is also makes the search easily. You, you can say search for this patient, emphasize the morphology more, emphasize the molecular side more, emphasize the patient demographic more. So the search becomes diversified, become, uh, gives uh, much more broader and deeper access to the physician to do his job. It's possible. We are not doing it in a mass at the moment. For example, we just started last week to combine text and image for the skin cancer atlas that we created. The data is there, but putting it in a structure that is suitable for this type of processing has never been done. So you make mistakes and then you learn and then you do it differently. Definitely, we have to do it. There is no way around it. Multimodal will be much easier than cross-modal. Emil? Emil, I see that you have a, a raise hand. Yes, I'm sorry. Wonderful pre presentation, Dr. Tizur. So um, regarding the whole slide images, all of this uh, and the atlas itself seems to be actually, um, you know, based on whole slide images of resection specimens. However, by contrast, biopsy specimens, which are very limited in in the tissue obtained may raise uh, you know, other challenges because the tumors are heterogeneous. Uh, there may be a matter of sampling or only some area of the tissue that was obtained is actually um, present in the biopsy itself. Uh, so the, the information that you get from a resection specimen may not actually be applicable to a particular biopsy that is obtained. So that is a major challenge. I don't know exactly, is there a way to go around this and try to address that? So we are, we are looking at multiple, we, we have not gone so far to look at those challenges. So we are starting with things that are relatively easy, indexable. Yes. Uh, uh, and we can put it in the atlas and we can use it and we can send the inquiry and get results. Uh, but what we have to look at when we talk about those challenging cases is a combination of give me more data of the patient. So do not process just one whole slide image of the patient. If you have more, and most of the time we have more, we have different cuts. Give me more, and then we have to do a different patching, which we are also experiencing with rare subtypes, which is you cannot just do sparse sampling. You need exhaustive brute force sampling. You need a lot more sample. Uh, from those cases. Uh, this is this is one thing. But again, so we have to recognize that this is the case, which may be easy, may be difficult, depending what the input is. And depending on that, we have to branch out and do a different uh, different processing and indexing for those cases. The, 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 the patient representation that I called is, again, indexing. How, what right. numbers you generate to put the patient in the atlas such that we can find the patient more easily uh, regarding the morphology. And for those cases, uh, it's basically the patching. How do I patch? How do, where do I look? Uh, not fundamentally different from what the pathologist does. How do I look? How much do I take away? And how much do I trust with, uh, to, the, to the patch that I'm taking? And do I have one glass light or multiple glass lights? Do I do, for example, we have not looked yet at the registration and then significance across cuts and things like that. We don't have 3D. People are talking about 3D whole slide images, which is my nightmare, but probably will improve the indexing. Um, all those things will happen. We cannot move ahead of time. We know that's going to be a challenge, but mm -hmm. let's start with relatively simple cases for the computer, establish the framework, 
and then we can attack those type of problems that you mentioned. Thank you very much. I have a second question. This is a little bit more philosophical, if you wish. So I understand that in order to, you know, you have to basically dream big in order to achieve big, but maybe going, you know, all the way for the final diagnosis um, means also circumventing, you know, some smaller steps that may happen before. Like, for example, you know, in practical surgical pathology, I would be very happy if kind of soon in the next few years, you know, the AI will be developed enough to, for example, recognize sim more simpler things instead of the final classification of a, a disease, a condition, it would go for how many of the lymph nodes they have to see for any resection specimens do contain metastatic disease, for example. So if the is this lymph node negative for carcinoma or not. So try to go for some kind of smaller steps in between simpler things that can actually fill up gaps and eventually help us. Because I don't really think AI will totally replace a pathologist, you know, uh, anytime soon. I don't think uh, AI can pathologist at all. Uh, if we trust the father of AI, Alan Turing, which uh, based on the test that he provides, the human being is in the center of evaluating the intelligence of any computer. And by definition, AI cannot be smarter than the human. It doesn't matter how much um, people get impressed with the chat GPT. Uh, you look at it, it's just a lot of structured knowledge that is available online, and then you tab into it. Uh, intelligence is not knowledge. So the intelligence that is in the head of the pathologist works in a different way. And I, again, I, I think just forget about the philosophy and the uh, uh, discourse of this sort, uh, just the legal ramification will not allow to, um, at, at the present stage, to uh, anybody do the pathologist work. But going back to your uh, to your suggestion, yes, absolutely. We have to figure out those small steps and actually they can be embedded in the indexing. So again, I cannot overemphasize how important patient representation is because patient representation means what type of numbers, what type of information we extract from the exams and images and molecular data such that computer can understand the patient. If the computer can understand the patient, represent the patient, then we can find better matches. And then when we find better matches, we can have uh, more reliable inferences with respect to anything, uh, triaging, diagnosis, prognosis, prediction, anything. But those small level primary uh, initial tasks are absolutely crucial. The question is which one of them for what case, for what condition, or relevant such that you can add it to the atlas or use it during the indexing to make life easier for everybody. So this is something really customized that you have to look at it. And the concept of atlas is a general, is agnostic to primary side, agnostic to the disease, but you have to build an atlas in every case from scratch because you have to know, okay, what, what do I use in this case? So in that case, it's something that we have to look at it from case to case. I have not done it yet. Thank you. Thank you. So now, now, I mean, the type of search uh, that you're doing uh, is essentially starting with a query of an image, is right? And you are looking at that image to search other images. But can you search also without looking at the microscopy description for, for a search, but type in, uh, I don't know, search for all the squamous proliferation with an undermining, uh, you know, architecture. Uh, and uh, uh, asking uh, uh, through AI, I mean, to look at all those images that somewhat um, are kind of analyzed by AI and kind of auto-generate kind of like a microscopic description because microscopic description, and I guess also like at, at Mayo, Mayo, I mean, for general surgical pathology, sometimes there is no microscopic description in age that uh, microscopy was performed. Um, so is there something like that that can be done? We, we have a primary uh, preliminary result published, uh, an approach that we call look in depth before you look el elsewhere. 
And we can go from image to text to description and go from description to image. It has to be a bi-directional street that you can describe something and we find a corresponding image. So not by, not by matching text with text. So we do not take your, in. so uh, you have to learn that that is like Milky Way galaxy and Andromeda galaxy, two different galaxies, images and text, very different spaces for search. But you have to find something that combines the characteristic of these two galaxies such that you can just travel between them like in a, a wormhole. So that's possible. Not us, not just us, many other research groups have shown that this is possible. We can go from textual description to image, and we can go from image to textual description with very different applications for histopathology. Very exciting to do that. At the moment, we are just indexing the diagnostic report along with the whole slide image. So we have two representation and we just attach them, concatenate them and say morphology description. So, and then you can search based on com combination of those and search based on emphasis on morphology or textual description. But it has to be a bi-directional approach if you take any other modality, not just text. Uh, and uh, I, I would say as, as research community, we are at the beginning of it. So we have seen the, the benefits and we have seen the possibilities, but this is again, so, something that companies cannot do. This is something that hospitals should do. Uh, the pathology departments should do because you have to, the knowledge to validate it. Validating unsupervised AI is very difficult. It's not like supervised AI. Another reason that supervised AI is more popular in literature because you can easily measure the accuracy. Whereas for unsupervised AI, you have to give the software to the pathologist. He or she has to work with it for a certain amount of time. You have to collect information in the background and then crunch the numbers and say, we have concordance between pathologists that suffer this much. So it's much more demanding validation than supervised AI. Another reason that, again, supervised AI is very popular. You can easily uh, test in the lab and get your 98% accuracy and publish your paper. That's fascinating, very interesting. Um, I don't see other question. Um, so Hamid, I mean, thank you very much. And, um, thank you going to be in touch. I mean, through Hamid also. Okay. Sure. Thank you very much for listening. I appreciate the opportunity.